want to smell and taste in here with hearing. Let's take care of smell first, then taste, and then the rest of the file will um, focus on, on hearing, okay? Your olfactory receptors are located in your olfactory epithelium, or I've used the phrase before. Uh-oh. Crisis averted. Oh, good. Olfactory mucosa. All right, which is located at the very roof of your nasal cavity. So, to give you some orientation here, let's maybe it won't work. Here's mucosa covered inferior nasal concha, specifically the left. Here's mucosa covered middle nasal concha, specifically the left. And then this much smaller shelf here. Left superior nasal concha. Okay. And embedded in this mucosa are neurons, which are way, way, way uh, over-exaggerated here. You can see this little orange that I'm using. It's embedded here okay, in that mucosa, uh, just inferior to the cripiform plate. Are these neurons that specifically are sensitive to, so they're sensory receptors, um, odorants? And odorants are essentially smell molecules okay dissolved in the air most of those neurons are as you probably already know bipolar okay And their axons kind of clump together. To form this olfactory bulb. And olfactory nerves. What's really cool, and this is not uncommon, is that also present are stem cells that specifically give rise to new olfactory sensory neurons pretty frequently. So we actually replace that olfactory mucosa every month or two. Very cool. And then uh, from from a mechanical standpoint, Uh, or I guess I should say physiological standpoint, Um, these receptors are metabotropic rather than ionotropic. Um, And hopefully you recall that metabotropic receptors uh, involve uh, G protein and therefore more steps or therefore more controllable than say ionotropic receptors, okay? Lining the entirety of the nasal cavity and um, 
this part here of the pharynx, which is called the nasopharynx, is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. It's only at that olfactory mucosa that those pseudostratified columnar cells are um, neighboring these neurons, okay? Now, if we go to the next slide, we're really, really, really zoomed in on the olfactory mucosa, and we can better see, oh, yeah, okay. So what the illustrator means by supporting cell is... one of those pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells. Okay. These olfactory neurons there's one. The receptive region, the cell body. Part of their axon is embedded in the olfactory mucosa. Oh, that's horrible reading. factory epithelium or mucosa, I don't care, all right? And then their axons traverse specifically through corporeal foramina. And they actually synapse with the next neurons in the chain in the bulb. So it's actually um, the second sensory neuron in that chain that's uh, giving rise this way to the olfactory tract, left and right olfactory tracts, really, okay? And then every once in a while, we'll spy very basally positioned, right? This is apical. factory stem cells that are replacing these olfactory sensory neurons quite frequently. And I don't think this is labeled on here, so is it? Yeah, I don't see it. So again, this passageway Cribriform foramen, and there are, of course, many, many, many cribriform foramina um, permeating the cribriform plate. Next slide. Just as we needed to know the the visual pathway, um, not just the pathway of light, but also the sort of pathway of information, we need to be able to do that with olfaction as well. This pathway starts when an odorant molecule binds to one of those olfactory receptors or olfactory sensory neurons, if you like that better, right? Thereby stimulating them. Those olfactory sensory neurons in turn stimulate neurons in the olfactory tract, uh, the second neurons in the, in the chain, if you will, okay? And that information gets relayed to olfactory cortex first. Primary olfactory cortex. Then
olfactory association area. But hopefully duh. <laughs> Right? And for that matter, if we're being really thorough, then we could actually squeak in here the mammillary bodies. Since they are specifically, actually, um, factory relay stations and then the thalamus a general sensory relay station I don't like the way that's written Ooh, good grief what am I doing making a mess that's what chicken butt association area we're going to run this information past the limbic system and again um, often uh, smells will um, elicit strong emotions we, we tend to have um, strong memories associated with smells okay so that's kind of why the, the authors are bringing up the limbic system again as well as um, multimodal regions like the frontal lobe okay Let's talk about taste, aka. Why am I using my own handwriting? This is so weird. I always write in all caps for students. Gustation would be the actual act of, of tasting something, just as. I just backed up for a hot second to slide to olfaction would be the act of smelling something. Okay. Taste buds, we typically think of them as being located on the tongue, but they aren't just located on the tongue. They're located on the soft palate. Um, let me go back to slide mm, two, actually, again, to point out the soft palette. So I'm zoomed way in on this image. This is soft palette, whereas this, reinforced with bone, is hard palette. Okay. This is specifically nasopharynx. Though we'll emphasize that more in 242. And this is specifically oropharynx. Though we'll emphasize that more in 242. And then uh, the part of the pharynx that the, the image is not showing is the region of the pharynx called the laryngopharynx. guy that's the tongue that being said if we go back now return to uh, slide five again the soft palate does feature taste buds the insides of course of your cheeks feature some taste buds your epiglottis features some taste buds. Your epiglottis is kind of like a, a flap that covers your trachea, hopefully, <laughs> whenever you swallow. Okay, and even your pharynx. 
So taste buds are not limited to the tongue. Most of your taste buds are on your tongue, but obviously not all of your taste buds are on your tongue. Most of your taste buds are associated with papillae, and a papilla is simply a bump. That's what that means. It's a bump, like a fleshy bump. Okay. We have three major types of papillae on our tongue. Fungiform, which might make you think of fun fungi. Yeah, kind of mushroom-like. Valate papillae and foliate papillae. And valley papillae are shown but not labeled. So I'll label those for you. Zooming in. These guys relatively small. They look like little mushrooms dotting the meadow are fungiform papillae. These guys, which kind of look like the margin or edge of a leaf, are called foliate foliage. Foliage. Foliate papillae. And then these guys are the valate papillae. And I remember that because they make an upside down V. Yeah, not really obtuse upside down V, but an upside down V, nevertheless. V is for valley. Okay. About 80% of your taste or your sense, I said, actually, I guess, yeah, I guess I shouldn't say sense. Um, about 80% of what you attribute, perceive, as smell is actually taste. Next slide more details about taste buds. So among the other cells of the covering of your tongue or the covering of your cheek or the covering of your um, oropharynx, which uh, should be non-keratinized. stratified squamous epithelium will be these gustatory sensory neurons. Okay. And Specifically, these gustatory sensory neurons have these extensions on them that are called gustatory hairs, which seems extra, extra gross that you would have hair on your tongue. <laughs> are they actual hair? No, no, no. Gustatory hairs, these projections, these extensions, they reach into what's called a taste pore, a taste pore. We'll see all of this in just a hot second. Saliva in the mouth acts as a solvent. It dissolves tastant molecules, uh, flavor molecules, okay? These gustatory sensory neurons are also replaced relatively quickly, uh, like your olfactory sensory neurons. Um, in fact, they're, they're replaced even faster, a matter of days rather than, say, weeks. Okay, and uh, contrary to popular um, belief, 
all of the areas of your tongue and, and your pharynx, everywhere that you have taste buds, um, all of them can, can taste all of the modalities. Sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami, savory. Um, they're all sensitive to those, okay? However, salty and sour modalities those tastants if you will those trigger ionotropic olfactory sensory neurons whereas bitter sweet and umami savory um, they trigger metabotropic mechanisms very cool all right, let's go to the next slide so we can better understand these hair things. <laughs> okay, so we're going to zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. Here's that same image of the tongue. We can see valate papillae. We can see foliate papillae. We can see fungiform papillae. And for the purpose of this explanation, we're just going to zoom way in on a valate papilla, okay? So this edge that I'm that I'm uh, demarcating is the same edge that I circled previously. Okay. Whereas you probably noticed that there's also a line here making these almost look kind of kind of nipple-like or bullseye-like, okay? That's because the papilla, the bump itself, is actually this extension. See how that's kind of folded in on itself to create a projection? So that, that's the actual papilla, valley papilla, all right? And then it's in that groove Let's sit the gustatory sensory neurons. So we're gonna zoom in even more. Wait, 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 wait in. And really these are these are roughly the same magnification. It's just a question of photograph, micrograph versus illustration, idealized illustration. Let's pay attention to the idealized illustration. <laughs> okay. So, what we're seeing here, let me choose some match-ish colors. Are actually epithelial cells, they're just highly, highly modified. So these are kind of, in that sense, akin to Merkel cells. Merkel cells are not actually neurons. They're more like pads that sit on nerve endings. Okay, so here's one of those epithelial cells. Here, neighboring that. Oh, that color is a perfect match. You can't even see it. Is another modified epithelial cell, okay? And kind of woven among these modified epithelial cells are nerve endings. Nerve endings. Nerve endings, uh, projections of neurons, okay? And these neurons are gonna clump together to form gustatory cranial nerves. 
it's depending on where these um, particular uh, taste buds are, the cranial nerves can vary, right? So if we're at the anterior tip of the tongue, that's gonna be one cranial nerve. If we're at the posterior of the tongue, that's gonna be another cranial nerve. Um, in this particular example, we're on the posterior of the tongue. Pharyngeal. And then that taste pour that I mentioned earlier, it's kind of an interruption in this non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And the longest of those gustatory hairs will sometimes even um, stick through that. Okay. And if we zoom in again on this kind of middlemost image, that pour would be here, 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 here. So facing that groove, all right? Very cool. All right, just as we needed to know visual and olfactory pathways, we need to know the gustatory pathway, at least in general. All begins when a taste molecule binds to a receptor. Those gustatory epithelial cells, which are sort of modified neurons, they will be stimulated and they will either um, synapse with sort of the second neurons in line that help to form facial, glossopharyngeal, or even vagus nerves. Okay. We're going to see a synapse in the medulla oblongata. We're headed ultimately to the gustatory areas, primary gustatory cortex, and then gustatory association area, um, as well as the limbic system. Give us emotional meaning. Okay. Let's start talking about the ear. Hopefully you already picked up on the fact that we're going to emphasize eye and ear much more so, or rather sight and hearing much more so than, than taste. Um, an olfaction. I guess I shouldn't say hearing hearing and equilibrium um, plus sight more so than than um, taste and smell. Okay. The ear, as I've mentioned before, features different regions or areas, neighborhoods. The outer ear, the middle ear, the inner ear, and the outer ear kind of works as a funnel. I'll come back to that. The middle ear is kind of a temporary um, or resealable coelom, which I've mentioned before, but long ago. And the internal or inner ear is where the actual neurons are housed. So um, hearing neurons, equilibrium neurons, okay? Let's look at the next slide, which is what, 10? External ear includes the external ear canal and the pinna. That ear flap, if you will, is a pinna. You have two pinnae, all right? The cutoff, the fence, if you will, for external ear and middle ear is this guy. This is your tympanic membrane or your eardrum. All right. And it's this, actually, let's do this. It's this area here. So 
that is your middle ear. The reason why I say it's a resealable or temporary sealum is that most of the time, this tube is closed. It's only when you're yawning or chewing pretty rigorously um, or swallowing pretty hard that this tube opens up. And that tube, uh, you might know it as eustachian tube, which is fine. fancier word is pharyngotympanic tube. This is specifically the right pharyngotympanic tube. Okay? And then all this crazy stuff that looks kind of like a snail shell, right? Kind of like a really cool roller coaster. That all belongs to the inner ear. Okay? We'll find out what all that's called soon enough. Next slide. Another name for pinna is oracle. I personally choose the word pinna, but either one's fine, okay? And it, it, can, it just acts as a funnel. So, uh, it kind of um, channels sound waves um, toward that external uh, ear canal or the auditory canal, okay? Your tympanic membrane or eardrum is, again, the fence. That, that delineates external or outer ear from middle ear, okay? And when sound waves hit that membrane, it vibrates, okay? It's very thin, it's translucent, and it's made out of connective tissue. And if I don't specify which connective tissue, then you don't need to know. That vibration in the tympanic membrane will be transferred to the bones that are sitting next to the tympanic membrane. And I'm actually gonna go hunt down, well, hopefully, I'm gonna try to hunt down some of those bones so you can actually see them. I'll be right back. Okay, grab the bones, so hopefully I'll remember to show them to you when I'm actually video recording this. Next slide, same image. And you guys know if an image shows up over and over again, it's probably important. Showing us pinna, showing us external ear canal or auditory canal or even external acoustic meatus would work. It's just really this is um, external acoustic meatus covered with tissue, right? The middle ear. small cavity temporarily enclosed because of again fringo tympanic tubes okay usually that tube is flattened to closed but when we yawn or swallow or chew um, it opens up and that actually helps to equalize the pressure inside that middle ear cavity with the surroundings. Okay, that's why when we're going up or we're down in an airplane, we're uh, kind of uncomfortable. Our ears start to hurt uh, if we don't pop our ears, all right? Anywho, the middle ear, um, again, features teeny tiny bones, actually the smallest bones in your, in your body. Um, three in each ear. Okay, and we'll talk about this very, very soon. It also features two membranous windows, which aren't really windows, they're thin spots. We have an oval window and a round window. Next slide, 14, I think. <laughs> Um, the three bones in your middle ear, six total, left and right, are collectively called ossicles, ossicles, okay? And they are malleus, incus, 
stapes. Malleus incus stapes. And if we list them in, in that order, then we're going from tympanic membrane to oval window. No matter whether it's the left ear or the right ear. Okay? You want to remember that they go in this order, malleus incus stapes, which I might pronounce the, those first letters as miss. Don't miss this on the exam. <laughs> the malleus articulates with the incus, the incus articulates with the stapes. The malleus also articulates with the tympanic membrane, and the stapes also articulates with the oval window. All right, and all of them are suspended by teeny tiny ligaments that uh, are, are for the most part not shown in I think any of our of our images. They're they're too tiny and uh, they kind of get in the way of, of comprehending. We make a hot mess out of our images. Okay. Next slide. We're zoomed in a little bit more. Oh. Hey, Tessa, show the students the actual bones. There, now I remember. <laughs> Uh-oh. Focus, focus, focus. Malleus. Incus. Stapes. Look how tiny they are. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? They're so tiny. Whoa. <laughs> okay, so if this is our tympanic membrane, then here's malleus. If the tympanic membrane vibrates, then in turn the malleus vibrates. If the malleus vibrates, then in turn the incus vibrates. If the incus vibrates, then in turn the stapes vibrates. And the stapes has this sort of foot. Like an almost oval shaped foot. And that foot is sitting on the oval window. That's why you can't see the oval window in this image because it's obscured by the oval shape of the foot of the stapes. Okay? So our fifth um, structure in this sort of relay race would be the oval window. Okay? Next slide, we'll come back to the oval window, by the way. The internal ear. So we want to convey those vibrations that just went through the middle ear to the inner ear, okay? And we're going to do that via the fence between them, which is, hopefully you can infer, the oval window, all right? There are two major neighborhoods of the inner ear. The bony labyrinth, the actual um, sort of um, bone reinforcement, okay? And within that, the membranous labyrinth, that actually maybe I shouldn't call these neighborhoods um, since one is nested within the other. Membranous labyrinth is nested within bony labyrinth, okay? And all of that really is divided into these neighborhoods. Vestibule, semicircular canals, cochlea, okay? And really we could point either, any of those out in, in either membranous or bony aspects, all right? The 
most of these different neighborhoods are filled with something called perilymph, which is similar in consistency to uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, we'll come back to that. Whereas part will be instead filled with endolymph, which is similar, but its chief difference is that it's especially rich in potassium ions. Potassium ions galore. Okay. We'll come back to all of that. It, it really is not going to make sense right now. If we go to the next slide, really what we're looking at is the bony encasement. And therefore, I can point out the neighborhoods, but I really can't see what's going on. This neighborhood is the vestibule. This neighborhood, the snail shell, if you will, is the cochlea. And this neighborhood, which we actually can't see part of in this particular view, that looks like a roller coaster. Okay, those are the semicircular canals. But if we use our x ray, x ray vision, then in the next slide, we can see oh, yeah, there are like sacs inside there. And it's actually those sacs that are, that are housing everything we need to achieve a sense, if you will, of equilibrium and a sense, if you will, of hearing, okay? Here's the stapes, which means it's sitting on an oval window, okay? Here again, vestibule. Here again, cochlea. And here we can see now all three, because we're using our x ray, x ray vision, semicircular canals. Okay. We're going to zoom in more and more and more. It's going to be crazy. Next slide, please. 19, I think. All right, the vestibule, kind of a central um, region, more or less egg-shaped. It houses two chief sac-like regions. One is called the saccule, and one is called the utricle, and we will point them out. These neighborhoods, these sacs, they house our equilibrium receptors, our equilibrium sensory neurons, okay? And collectively, the saccule and the utricle are called maculae. The semicircular canals, again, there are three, really six if you, if you think of left and right, okay? And they are oriented along, um, well, I think of it as a 3D graph. Uh, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, okay? So they're oriented along three different planes. One of them is, is um, if, you're, if you're looking via x-ray, x-ray vision into somebody's head and they're facing you, one of them is coming out of the, uh, the head toward you, one of them is pointing um, out of the head away from you, and one of them is pointing like out of the head toward the side laterally okay anywho these guys of course are filled with with membranous sacs right and uh in each one we'll find again a, like a an area that's dense with receptor um cells uh, dense with equilibrium sensory neurons okay these are called crista well plural cristae Okay, each one, Christa ampularis, Christa ampularis, okay? 
So that means that we have really per ear, one, two, three, four, five regions of densely packed equilibrium receptors. Okay. The cochlea is in reality about the size of a split pea. So half a pea. Isn't that crazy? It looks so... <laughs> it looks so dominant and and majestic when you when you're looking at these gorgeous illustrations that are zoomed so so far in the cochlea is divided internally into three chambers we'll come back to that all right for now next slide this is an image we're going to see over and over and over again wink wink nudge nudge Here and here are the two maculae. Maculae. Oh, you know, I actually misspoke earlier. The maculae are the regions of, of dense equilibrium receptors. But the rooms, if you will, that they sit in, I'll use this color. Are the utricle and the saccule. So I'm actually going to go back. Actually, I think we're fine. I think we're okay. Okay. And again, maculae are. Maculae is plural. Regions dense with equilibrium receptors. All right, whereas Here, here, and here. I just used a yellow dot. Those are the three per ear. Criste ampullaris. Each one is a crista ampullaris. These are also regions that are dense. with equilibrium receptors. Okay. Let's move on. So remember I, I mentioned that the, um, uh, good grief. <laughs> cochlea internally is divided into uh, three chambers. Each one has its own special name. Yay! The scala vestibule or vestibuli. The scala media, which is also known as the cochlear duct. Those are the same thing. And the scala tympani. The scala vestibule is actually crammed up against the oval window. It contains perilymph. The scala tympani is crammed up against the round window and it contains perilymph. They're actually continuous with each other. This is more or less of a tube. And if 
we're headed this way in the tube, okay, the tube eventually folds. Eh, I'll use this space over here. <laughs> yes, it's a much tighter fold in actuality, okay. That fold is called the helicotrema. Helicotrema, right here. Okay. This part of the tube is scale of vestibule. Whoopsie. And this part of the tube is scala tympani. Okay, so it's really one tube, just folded, just folded. So really that's all one sort of collection of perilymph, all right? Well, sandwiched between the two is yet another tube, another sac, and that's the scala media. So to really get in your way as much as possible, this sac would be scale of media. Totally not to scale. <laughs> Thank goodness we'll have illustrations that make more sense. <laughs> well, the scale of media is separated from um, scale of vestibule or scale of vestibuli by a partition, okay, that's called the vestibular membrane. They have a shared wall, in other words. Vestibular membrane. That vestibular membrane would be like here. Okay. The scale of media does not contain perilymph, it contains endolymph. What's special about endolymph? Lots and lots of potassium. And the membrane that secretes that endolymph is called the stria vascularis. We'll point it out when we get there, okay? If the vestibular membrane is the roof of scala media, then the floor, or on the floor, is the basilar membrane. And sitting on top of that basilar membrane, is this really crazy thing called the spiral organ. And it's the spiral organ that actually houses the hearing, if you will, neurons, okay? We're gonna meet hair cells there in the spiral organ. Some of them will be called inner hair cells. Some of them will be called outer hair cells, but they're all housed within the spiral organ. And again, the spiral organ sits on top of the basilar memory okay next slide so same image that we've been working with okay but the bad news is that at this uh, scale we really can't see any distinction between the three different scale the three different chambers okay so we're gonna zoom in more which is what's happening in the next slide. All right, the bone reinforcement would be part of the bony labyrinth. Gosh, how do you spell labyrinth? Is that labyrinth? <laughs> I just realized I've never I don't think I've ever written the word labyrinth before. It's a fun word. Yeah, I spelled it correctly. Boy, it looks funny. Anywho. Whereas, and we'll use this one. Filling that labyrinth is fleshy membranous sac, membranous labyrinth, okay? 
and notice that there are what appears to be three different sacs or tubes. This looks like one, this looks like another, and this looks like another. Okay. What are we really looking at? This guy is scale of vestibuli. This guy. Scale of tympani. Okay. And this guy is. Scale media, All right? Which means, in turn, okay. I'm already making a mess out of that one, so I'm going to go to the next one. That this wall between scala vestibuli and scala media is our vestibular membrane. This wall between scala media and scala tympani is the basilar membrane. Oops. Would you have ever imagined that you, you had something that looks like this in your, in your body? It's amazing, amazing. And if we zoom way in, we can start to see the beginning of that spiral organ, but we'll come back to that. Okay. Well, because this is really just three total membranous sacs or tubes that are coiled, that are coiled, this, um, where I put the number one originally, is continuous with this and this and this, and this, okay. Number three, continuous. This is all one tube that's just coiled up, coiled up, okay. Number two, continuous. All one tube just coiled up. It's difficult to wrap your head around, but God, the puns. <laughs> Uh, hopefully we'll get it eventually. All right, in the next slide, which is 24, we're zoomed in even more, even more. Okay, this is a nice slice, not as three-dimensional as the, the last image, but um, it's zoomed in so much that we can really see our chambers. Scala vestibuli. Scala tympani, okay? Here, this membrane Vestibular membrane Here, this membrane Basilar membrane Okay Scala media uh, there's our spiral organ here. 
sitting right on top of that basilar membrane. And now we're meeting a third membrane. It's actually the sort of private roof of the spiral organ here. It's called the tectorial membrane. Tectorial membrane. It's going to be important. Okay. Scale of tympani and scale of vestibuli are actually one tube that's folded on itself. Therefore, this perilymph is really the same stuff as this perilymph. Okay. Scale of media, again, is instead full of endolymph. Oh, and by the way, before I forget, it's this wall here that is the stria vascularis. What's, what's the job of the stria vascularis? I mean, other than containment. Yeah, that's where we're producing endolymph. All right, next slide is even crazier, reserving in even more. <laughs> and this is not our last stop <laughs> on the Zoom mobile. There's our tectorial membrane. Right, we're zoomed way, way in. There's our basilar membrane in between scala tympani and scala media. Okay. Our spiral organ is huge and we can better see oh okay the spiral organ is comprised of epithelial cells okay with a few um sensitive modified really neurons sandwiched between here's three, and they're actually arranged in a row. So in other words, there's another, if these are called A, B, and C, there's another A uh, sitting alongside this A, another A sitting along that A, and another A sitting along that A. There's another B sitting along this side, this B, another B sitting along the side, that B, so on and so forth. Okay, these are the outer hair cells. And notice that they have these, these things. They're not actually hairs. They're called stereocilia that are kind of sticking up, okay? And we'll zoom in on these too, and we'll find out, oh, not all of these are actually in contact with the tectorial membrane, but you know what? Some are, and that's gonna be important. And then here, also in the spiral organ, and also arranged in a row, Okay, we'll find inner hair cells, and they also have these things that are called stereocilia. They look like hair, but they're not actually hair, all right? And then in the corner of the slide, what we're looking at is an electron micrograph of these hair cells, okay? Really, they're stereocilia, but do you see how this is lots and lots of cells arranged in a row? This is lots and lots of cells arranged in a row. This is lots and lots of cells arranged in a row, so on and so forth. So it's not as if we have four total hair cells. <laughs> this is just a section, right? So we can only see four at a time. So three rows of outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells, okay? Next slide is just a blankety blank for you to practice labeling until forever. <laughs> now let's start talking about how all of this actually works now that we know the anatomy. All right, so sound has entered the external acoustic meatus and vibrates the tympanic membrane. Okay. The louder the sound, the more the tympanic membrane will vibrate. In turn, the ossicles, in what order? Malleus, incus, then stapes, will vibrate 
and thereby transfer that vibration to the oval window. Now here's what's really cool. The tympanic membrane is about 20 times larger. So, I don't know. Maybe like that? Then the oval window. Therefore, a subtle, not too crazy, vibration in the tympanic membrane will be fairly significant by the time it reaches the oval window. So, in other words, um, it's kind of like transferring uh, momentum from different, uh, differently sized gears, right? Uh, it takes uh, not so many uh, much effort to turn uh, a gear that's rather large. And when that rather large gear uh, turns in um, a smaller gear, it can turn that smaller gear many, many, many times. Kind of the same principle um, that, that the size difference really has to amplify those vibrations, okay? In turn, because the oval window is now vibrating, vibrations get transferred to perilymph, specifically the perilymph of scale of vestibuli, because it's scale of vestibuli that is in contact with the oval window, okay? Well, because scale of vestibuli is fluid filled, the vibrations in the fluid that we call air, okay, now become vibrations in the fluid that we call perilymph. So, um, sound waves become fluid waves, more, more liquid-like, okay? But waves nonetheless, all right? And that perilymph is gonna wiggle, 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 wave, 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 okay? Possibly, possibly around the helicotrema and through scale of tympani and all the way to the round window. In other words, scala vestibuli starts with the oval window. Scala tympani ends with the round window. Okay? And because both windows are actually just thin spots, that round window, if that wave gets, gets all the way through there, it's going to bulge back out toward the middle ear, okay? Wavelengths that are, um, they're, they're, actually I shouldn't say wavelengths, um, frequencies, uh, wave frequencies that are below our threshold. In other words, um, they're, the frequency isn't high enough to stimulate our hair cells, okay? will simply travel through scale of vestibuli around helicotrema and through scale, oops, scale of tympani. So all the way from oval to round. Okay, whereas Sound waves that are R of a frequency that's that's within our our um, hearing range, they will get transferred from scala vestibuli through to scala media. Okay, and in turn vibrate the basilar membrane, because the basilar membrane sits um, under the spiral organ, those hair cells in the spiral organ, they get disturbed, they get agitated. We'll come back to that. In other words, well, this picture isn't complete yet. Let's look at the next slide. This particular illustration unfurls the cochlea somewhat so that you can better see oh yeah 
Indeed. This tube, if you will, is scale of vestibuli. This tube is scale of media. This tube is scale of tympani, where scale of vestibuli turns the corner to give rise to scale of tympani. That's the helical trauma. Okay. If a sound wave is not in our hearing range, then it's actually going to round that helical trauma corner. Okay. If it is in our, our, our hearing range, then it's going to get transferred from the perilymph of scala vestibuli to the basilar membrane. And therefore, scala media. I don't know what symbol I just made. I'm just going to get rid of it. <laughs> Supposed to be a little arrow. A little arrow. There we go. Okay. Again, tympanic membrane vibrates. In turn, vibrates malleus, then incus, then stapes. In turn, vibrate oval window. In turn, Disturb fluid in scale of vestibuli. Assuming those waves are in our hearing range, then from scala vestibuli into scala media, and thereby vibrating basilar membrane. Okay, we'll come back to this part. All right, next slide. So it turns out that the basilar membrane, I'm gonna overemphasize this in a little sketch. It's actually shaped, again, this is way overemphasized, like this. So if we were to unfurl the cochlea and pull out in one fell swoop, the basilar membrane, we find out, oh, on this end, furthest from helical trauma, this is closest to helical trauma, or the apex, okay? The fibers that make up the basilar membrane, they're rel relatively short, short, short. Okay, and the closer we get to helicotrema, they're long, the longer they get, okay? It's because of this very gradual change in the length of basilar membrane fibers that different frequencies will transfer to scala media at different positions. Isn't that cool? It's just fascinating. Next slide, which is uh, 30. Okay, we know that our basilar membrane is going to be um, disturbed, right? It's going to be um, um, vibrated, okay? And we know that sitting on top of the basilar membrane is the spiral organ, and the spiral organ houses inner hair cells, a row of three, and outer hair cells, a row of just, just a single row, right? rather than three rows, I guess I should say, okay? Well, we're gonna focus on inner hair cells for now, and, and we'll come back to outer hair cells, I promise. We already know that they're called hair cells because apically they feature not true hairs, but stereocilia, okay? And it turns out that 
each stereocilium has at its base a hinge. At its base, a hinge. At its base, a hinge. Okay, and because they're hinged, that means that they could they could be bent this way, like that way. Right? Okay. It also turns out that not all the stereocilia located on an inner hair cell are the same length. Just as the fibers of the basilar membrane vary predictably in length, so do stereocilia. So for instance, if these are the stereocilia born on a, an inner hair cell, notice that they're not all the same length. But certainly at their base, each one has a hinge, okay? It's only the longest of those stereocilia that will actually be in contact with and actually embedded in the tectorial membrane, okay? However, if the longest stereocilium bends, it takes all the other stereocilia along for a ride. And that's because they're all linked together. There are little bonds between them called tip links. <laughs> Okay, which ensure that if the longest stereocilium gets bent, they all get bent. Okay. Well, when those stereocilia get bent, ion channels. It opened. In other words, mechanically gated ion channels. Isn't that crazy cool? I love it. If stereocilia bend Toward shorter, the shortest, I guess I should say, stereocilia, then ion channels close. So, what way do they have to bend in order for ion channels to open? Yeah, toward that longest stereocilium. Very switch-like, just fascinating. All right, next slide. This is an image we've seen already, but now it has much more context for us, okay? There are outer hair cells. It looks like three, but it's really three rows. All right, we'll come back to inner hair cells. If you go to the next slide, oh, okay. There's a stylized, really, really zoomed in image of an, an outer hair cell, just a single one, okay? It's sitting on a nerve ending, kind of like a Merkel cell would in, in the skin, okay? And again, there are projections, stereocilia, apically. Each one is hinged, each one can bend but only at the base, okay? And they're linked to their neighbors, tip links. All right. If the basal or membrane, which is here, by the way. Oh, I need a different color so you can see. If the basal or membrane is disturbed in such a way that the stereocilia bend toward the longest stereocilium, then ion channels, specifically mechanically gated ion channels, will open. 
we'll see a depolarization, a potential in other words, initiated. Those outer hair cells will release more so neurotransmitter and those neurotransmitters will elicit, initiate more frequent act potentials along specifically the cochlear nerve, okay? Whereas if the stereocilia are bent away from the longest stereocilium, in other words, toward the short est um, stereocilium, then the opposite happens. Those mechanically gated ion channels close, the cell hyperpolarizes, and therefore releases fewer neurotransmitter molecules, and therefore we see fewer and less frequent X potentials along the cochlear nerve. So cool. Okay, now let's talk about outer hair cells. Oh, you know what? I have been misspeaking this whole time. Wow, and this is not the first time in this lecture. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, let's see, where can I... I guess, I guess I'll put this here. It's, it's on the slide. Uh, my, my mouth keeps saying outer hair cells. These are actually inner hair cells. Okay. Um, I even I even circled it. Good grief! Back on slide thirty. What a silly goose. Okay. Anywho, inner hair cells is what we've been talking about. Now let's talk about what the job of outer hair cells is. What are those guys there for? What what's their dealio? We have far more of those, right? three rows rather than just one row, okay? Well, these guys they have the ability to contract as well as stretch a bit, okay? Therefore, they can change how taut, how stiff the basal or membrane is. All right? Their job is therefore to influence how responsive the basilar membrane is to vibration. If it's more taut, then it's sensitivity to vibration is different than if it's loosey-goosey. Kind of the principle behind moving a taut rubber band versus a loose rubber band or a taut guitar string versus a, a loosey-goosey guitar string. Okay? Why? Who cares how responsive the bacillar membrane is to vibrations? How sensitive it is well being able excuse me to change the stiffness of the bacillar membrane means that our outer hair cells can actually protect our inner hair cells from especially loud noises by decreasing how much the basilar membrane is allowed to move Decreasing movement would mean an increase in stiffness. Isn't that amazing? I think that's so cool. All right, let's start talking about equilibrium. So <laughs> equilibrium is really um, most relevant for movements of the head. In other words, our, our equilibrium sensory neurons they're only sensitive to, to where our head is in space. That's why um, 
For instance, the cerebellum, as an editor, needs information from other parts of our, of our body, like our joints and tendons and skeletal muscles, proprioceptors, um, to, to know where the rest of our body is in space, okay? We track Actually, I want, to, I want to phrase this differently. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to another slide. So we'll, we'll, phrase, we'll phrase this differently in just a moment. Okay. The maculae, one in the utricle, one in the saccule, right? They specifically are sensitive to linear acceleration. So for instance, um, moving forward in a car or um, even moving up or down in an elevator, okay? Whereas we'll find out soon that the cristae ambularis are sensitive to um, centripetal acceleration. For now, let's go to slide 36. So each macula, again, is, is a really dense concentration of equilibrium receptors. And surprise, there are lots and lots of hair cells. <laughs> that we can find in each macula. Okay, so the this, this sensory cells are called hair cells yet again. These hair cells are called hair cells because they have, surprise, stereocilia, okay? But this time, instead of these stereocilia, or at least the longest of them, being embedded in a tectorial membrane, they're embedded in an otolith membrane, okay? And the membrane is kind of jelly-like, but it's wearing lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of teeny tiny little rocks that are made out of calcium carbonate. And those teeny tiny little rocks are called otoliths. You have rocks in your ears. Wow. Well, Having all of these, and we'll see, it's certainly a better um, depiction of these. Having all of these rocks sitting atop the otolith membrane, that, that jelly-like membrane, means that this membrane has a lot of weight. It has a lot of mass, okay? And that, in turn, means that it takes a pretty good amount of force, a pretty good amount of acceleration to actually move the otolith membrane and therefore trigger the movement of stereocilia. So it's, it's, that weight is like insurance that um, we won't detect ex uh, linear acceleration that is that is far too minor, far too minor, right? Otherwise, can you imagine how disoriented we'd be? The macula in the utricle will respond to linear acceleration along a horizontal plane horizontal plane. So like forward, backward, um, tilting, all right? Whereas macula in the saccule respond to linear acceleration. Oops, I don't like that part. Along a vertical, 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 there we got it, plane. So like uh, the elevator up and down movements, up and down movements. Okay, very cool. 
Next slide. Much better depiction of otoliths sitting atop and embedded in an otolith membrane and lots of stereocilia born on the apical aspect of hair cells. So there's a collection of stereocilia on top of a hair cell. Okay. Hot wired very much so like what we saw in in the hearing part of the ear. Next slide. So same gist, the direction of bend matters. If stereocilia, which yes, are linked together, <laughs> okay, if they're all bent toward the longest stereocilium, then again, we're going to see depolarization, release of neurotransmitters, and an increase in action potentials along, in this case, the vestibular nerve before, before it fuses with um, auditory nerve to give rise to vestibular cochlear. Anywho, if the stereocilia are bent away from the longest stereocilium, in other words, toward the shortest stereocilium, then that hair cell will hyperpolarize, but will not release as much neurotransmitter. Action potentials along the vestibular nerve will be less frequent. Okay. And that Morse code is what the brain needs to determine whether we're moving forward or backward. In this case, tilting forward or backward. Next slide. The crista ampullaries, plural, for singular crista ampullaris, they are sensitive to rotational, rotational acceleration rather than linear acceleration. All right. There is a collection of these equilibrium receptors that are sensitive to rotational acceleration at more or less the base of each semicircular canal. Okay, so think spinning in terms of rotational. Okay, recall that, that semicircular canals are oriented along three different planes. Therefore, um, the crista ampullaries are sensitive to any rotational movements, well, just about any rotational movements of the head, not just along one plane, in other words, okay? If we look at the next slide, which is 40, notice that within the base, if you will, of each semicircular canal is a collection of surprise hair cells. <laughs> Here's a hair cell, and here is the crazy plumage <laughs> of stereocilia. It's featuring um, apically. And notice that those stereocilia are embedded in this thing. Oops, good grief. That's called a cupula. I don't think, have we seen cupula? I don't think we have before. Okay, that cupula is kind of similar to an uh, otolith mem membrane, okay, or kind of similar, I guess, in that sense, functionally, to a tectorial membrane, okay. Next slide. When we are not 
rotating, and, and we're just going with the simplest idea of rotating, uh, spinning, twirling, okay? Then that copula just stands straight up, and so do all of the stereocilia that are embedded in its base, okay? Whereas, when we rotate, this jelly-like copula shifts to match that, that rotation, okay? And as a result, the stereocilia embedded in that copula get bent, hair cells depolarize, they release neurotransmitter, and we get frequent action potentials, okay, along the vestibular nerve. So cool. When we slow down that spin, uh, when we're approaching a stop to our spinning, the endolymph that's actually inside semicircular canals, it ends up bending the copula in the opposite direction and more or less turning those hair cells off, flipping the switch in the other direction. Isn't that so cool? Fascinating. Fascinating. And in fact, um, there is, there's so much more detail that we could go into um, in terms of, of how your ears work and, and even how your eyes work. And I, I think of this as is really just um, skimming your special sensory organs. It's so, so fascinating.